Okay, welcome everybody. Um, my name is Nasser. I just want to start off by welcoming you all. This is uh, our first in-person event in two years. So I just want to start off by thanking everyone who's made this possible, everyone at Kivo, everyone, all of our guests and panelists who have come, but also everyone in the audience who's made the effort to be here in person today and everyone on Zoom uh, joining us virtually. We're, we're really very grateful for everyone being with us. I know it's, it's been a little bit trickier than usual and it was touch and go for a long time. So we are very happy to finally, finally be here. I also just want to at the out outset very quickly thank all of our co-sponsors and supporters everyone at the Dia Art Foundation, uh, the Departments of History, uh, uh, Middle East and Islamic Studies, uh, International Relations, International Relations, Social and Cultural Analysis, Global Journalism, the Tisch School of the Arts. We've had incredible buy-in and support for this conference and we are really, really incredibly grateful. Um, I wanna say a very quick word about the series, the conference, very briefly, I won't take too much time and about the format and then I'll make super quick introductions and we can, uh, we can get on with it. Um, so this conference, these two days, really come as a kind of close. They come to cap off our Global Uprising series, which we ran last academic year. Uh, and the series really, I think, began taking shape for us in the summer of 2020, really as a way to pause and to try to take stock of a world all around us that, at the time, seemed to be in a kind of open revolt, right? And I mean the world ar around us, both the kind of immediate world around us, right, the direct world around us, this city, these streets, this neighborhood, which in the summer of 2020 were in sort of full-blown rebellion during the George Floyd uprising. And I mean the world around us also in the sense of that period, that time coming as this was after that very intense wave of uprising in 2019 that also had this kind of global expanse and geography everywhere from Lebanon and Algeria, Iraq to Colombia, Chile, Haiti, um, and that you know, really, really kind of shook the world in 2019. And we wanted to, to think of that moment. We wanted to think of that 2019, 2020 moment alongside what was then coming up as the 10th anniversary of the 2011 Arab revolt. Right, that whole global concatenation, the movement of the squares, Tahrir, global Occupy, and to think about how can we think of these together, right? How can we think of this long decade of popular uprising without reducing it to a single typology, without reducing it to a sort of single itinerary or, or, or list, right? But somehow also come to terms with what were the resonances, the connections between, between these places and these events and these, these times, right? Um, and I think for us that meant as much as possible beginning from the world of social struggle, beginning with and from the world of social struggle. And so we try to start with a very simple open question that kind of frames the series, which is how do we rethink collective action from our present, right? Beyond any sort of evaluative frameworks of success or failure, beyond any kind of typology, how do we come to terms with collective action as it takes shape in our present, right? A present that we kind of felt seemed to be defined by this generalized insurgency, right? At least by a kind of frequency and intensity of insurgency that, that was quite sharp, right? Or as we had it then, a present that seemed to be not just of uprising, but a present that was uprising in a certain sense. Um, and, so, and so we had uh, a, a, a kind of 14 sessions or 14 uh, different components. We had discussions about uh, racialization and anti-blackness. We had sessions on periodization and the temporality of uprising. We had sessions on dispossession, extractivism, the connections to finance. We had possessions on the place of policing and all of this. Um, we took in uh, the kind of place of gender in uprising. We thought about sort of different spatial modalities and tactics, the return of the commune as a kind of imaginary and tactic. And we thought about the afterlife of uprising, right? We thought about not just incarceration and exile and all the very depressing stuff, but also how uprising persists after ruptural event, after that moment of street politics, right? And movement and migration and so on. And the conference today is, is really, and tomorrow is meant to really take up some of the most incessant and persistent questions that came up in the series, right? And, and particularly these two questions or two concepts that we had to, to a degree, bracketed and maybe even avoided, um, but which kept on returning and in a way kept on insisting. And that is revolution and decolonization. Um, and I won't say too much about that now 
Um, I will say that we've asked our panelists to respond to a series of prompts. And you can find the prompts in the program. You can find them uh, on the website if you, if you go to the website. Um, so I'm not going to repeat them now. But the idea, just in terms of format, is each of our panelists will take about 12 to 15 minutes to respond to these prompts. And then our moderators will uh, pose a couple of questions maybe, uh, see if the panelists want to respond to each other in any way, and open it up to you all, right? The idea of this is to be as kind of conversational as possible. We're thinking of both panels really as a kind of single single space, a single event. So it's, it's you know, the, the more you get involved, the better. Um, I just want to give some very, very brief um, introductions to our speakers today. Thank them again for being with us. Um, I also want to say, since uh, before I forget, that I'd request that nobody try to join the Zoom meeting from within the audience because it could cause some technical issues. Um, masks, again, are, <laughs> yeah, masks are um, encouraged in the <laughs> audience, we shall say. So if you, you could keep them on unless, I don't know, you're asking a question or something, that would also be appreciated. So um, in the order of their appearance, and these are very brief bios that do no justice to their accomplishments, um, but there are fuller bios on the website. There are fuller bios that should be coming up in the Zoom now. But in the order of their appearance, Zahra Ali is an assistant professor at Rutgers University and a sociologist. And she's the author, most recently, of Women and Gender in Iraq Between Nation Building and Fragmentation. Fadi Bardawil is an associate professor of Asian and Middle East Studies at Duke University and the author, most recently, of Revolution and Disenchantment Arab Marxism and the Process of Emancipation. Max Weiss is also associate professor of history and Near Eastern studies at Princeton University and the author of the forthcoming Revolutions Aesthetic, a cultural history of Ba'ath Assyria. And Sarah Persley, who's going to be our moderator today, is assistant professor of Middle Eastern and Islamic studies at New York University and the author, of course, of Familiar Futures, Time, Selfhood, and Sovereignty in Iraq. So if you'd join me, please, in giving them all a warm welcome, we can go ahead. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, <coughs> is it working? Yeah? Okay. Uh, thank you, Nafa. Uh, thank you, James. It's such a wonderful, wonderful series. I've attended uh, many of your the events that you organize as part of this series on Zoom. I really learned a lot, and, and I have to say it feels good to be here physically, <laughs> to have my body sitting here with you all. I, I also have very, very good experiences in this room in particular, attending or participating to events. So thank you so, so much. Um, so I'm going to jump right in so that I don't take <laughs> too much time. Uh, so revolutions in the region have often been uh, analyzed through theoretical frames that in many ways dictate what they should be. So for some, it's about revolution, because supposedly it lacks a radical agenda. In the case of Iraq, the scholarship refers to the October Revolution sometimes as a Shia uprising, some sometimes as a youth uprising, sometimes as people denouncing corruption. For some, the uprisings or the revolutions in the regions were not feminist enough, they don't have real agendas. They are not political enough because they don't talk about capitalism, they don't talk about class struggles or imperialism. And in many ways, I feel that a lot of the scholarship about the revolutions or the uprisings, whatever we call them, is trying to put order in the messiness. Uh, um, and I feel that in the inability to make sense of the poetic, many scholars fall into predefined ideological or theoretical framing. And what I'm trying to think about and offer is another approach, where I'm letting the categories of um, analysis emerge from the protest and the protesters, and the very discursive and material reality defined by space and time, and how bodies and affects are mobilized. So it's important to point out also, as kind of an introductory uh, remark, um, the abstractness of the ways in which terms such as democracy or civil society or even women's rights are often used in, uh, in, the, sc in the scholarship about protests. And I think it's also ne necessary to show for example, that what is often considered as local 
is in reality the product of transnational dynamics of postcoloniality and empire, and that is what is often considered as global can be white, middle class, and neoliberal. So some of the questions that are central for me in situating Iraq in the discussion about revolution are what does the October Revolution tell us about the meaning of the political? What happens when we center the experiences and the subjectivities of Iraqi protesters in the understanding of emancipation? What changes when Iraq and Iraqis are taken as a framework in the common understanding and theorizing about life, or more precisely, living a dignified life, especially in the age of what many call the interpretive? So Thawra Tashrin, the October Revolution, happened mainly in the central and southern region of the country. And of course, it was made possible by various protest movements, and all the protests benefited from the organizing skills uh, of established and formally organized activists, such as students and workers' union and advocacy groups. However, what was very, very distinctive about, about uh, this wave of protest that became uh, an uprising is that the poor, those who live on daily wages, the tuk-tuk drivers, the street sellers, the porters, the unemployed, remained at the center of, of the protest. And also very importantly, women. Women's massive participation turned what could have been another wave of protest into the October Revolution. So the main slogans were very general, and read Watan, we want a country, and read an Aish, we want, we want to live a life. And it expressed both a rage and a desire a rage against a system that does not offer anything for people to live a dignified life, a rage against what I call the various forces of death that are structural, infrastructural, and political. And I prefer using forces of death rather than necropolitics because I want to stay away from talking about death world. <laughs> and these forces of death that have shaped Iraqi's life since at least the 1990s with the US-led intervention, whether in the form of military bombings or invasion and occupation, or in the form of the sanctions, uh, an invisible war that ravaged the country, and also the forces of death of the Green Zone regime, the post-2003 regime, and its various armed groups and militias. And it's also, as I said, an expression of a desire for what protesters call al madaniya or al-hayat al madaniya defining a citizenship based on a cosmopolitan urban life with services and infrastructures and individual freedom. The Green Zone regime put in place by the US occupation administration in which um, the majority of the protesters grew up. I mean, the majority of the protesters are under 25 years old. Actually, the majority of Iraqis are under 25 years old. Um, is this system, this Green Zone regime, is a hyper-militarized, what I call sectarian regime, a regime based on the separation of people based on their sex, ethnicity, religion, and gender. Sectarianism actually does not only refer to the political system that was put in place after 2003, but it also refers to the very material separation of people by checkpoints and concrete sea walls, and a very patriarchal, heterosexist, militaristic control of people's dress code, social and spatial uh, mobility and everyday conduct. In fact, the language used by protesters is a very affective language. People has, have used words referring to the everyday humiliation, indignity, medelle, ghem, dishonor, describing their daily life, characterized by intense social control and the exhausting repetition of obstacles on their bodies, constraints that take away their time, and social and spatial mobility, from the stop and search at checkpoints to having to pay the equivalent of two years' salary as a bribe to obtain a job in the public sector, or paying a percentage of your monthly earning to an armed group or to a politician if you want to open a business, and very importantly, the electricity cut, especially in the summer times when the temperature can be as high as 53 degrees Celsius, which is, I think, 125 uh, Fahrenheit and when state-sponsored electricity is no more than five to six hours a day, 
and when private generators cost as much as half of the salary of a public employee. In the squares of protest, people have come together with their bare lives and bodies. They have faced the te technologies of death of the Green Zone regime, namely the snipers and their M4 rifle. And by the way, the M4 rifle was the main weapon used by the US forces. It was actually developed out of the M16 that was massively used during the Vietnam War. And also the expired tear gas canisters that pierced the skulls and bodies of protesters. Um, and so they have established a miniature society. They collectively formed as people and bodies, a material, spatial, temporal and affective infrastructure that centers living a dignified life. So people like the tuk-tuk drivers who became ambulances carrying the bodies of the injured and the killed protesters became the heroes of an, or another social order. In Tahrir Square and other square also in, in the south of, of, of Iraq, um, people have produced a material, discursive and affective space in which they can meet, live together, sleep, take bath, cook and eat, sing and, day, and dance, debate constitutional reforms as much as football, People established a cinema, a theater, set up libraries all over the squares of protest. They reclaimed the public space and covered the streets with murals, drawings, and paintings. The space and time produced by protesters is the frame in which they can negotiate an alternative social contract and experience new codes of conduct that question the dominant, hyper-militarized, privatized, masculinist, and nepotist dominant space-time. They have put forward a public comment and proposed alternative state forms that value and support a dignified life. And th this alternative social order put at its center those whose lives are marginalized, so easily erased and often seen as disposable. Those who are the most precarious, the poor and women. And in fact, what has characterized the October Revolution is that it has done two things. Its raison d'etre quickly became honoring shohada, the martyrs, which also meant breaking with fear in naming the militias and the armed groups that are responsible for the repression of all forms of revolt since 2002. Tahrir and other squares around the country became places of remembrance where those killed in the protests were given afterlife in mourning rituals and memorials. And at the same time, the revolution also became about celebrating life, paying respect to those at the center of it, women. Many slogans centered women and defied the patriarchal social order, such as uh, um, no, no, your voice is not shameful, uh, uh, a woman's voice is a revolution. And protesters have mocked the very gendered and sexual language and politics of the repression. And this relationship between honoring the shuhada, the martyrs, and celebrating life tells the story of the past decade in Iraq. When men have died or been broken by decades of war, and women have sustained life, took care of people, and as it is commonly said in Iraq, women carry society on their shoulders while dealing with tight social control over their lives and bodies. And actually, many protesters decided to break with patrilineal names and use their matrilineal name and be referred to as sons and daughters of their mothers, breaking with the dominant practice to name people Ibn Abu, uh, the son of the children of a man. Um, and you probably, I mean, some of you probably heard of, of the icon of the October Revolution, Safa al Sarai, who was killed by a tear gas canister at 26 years old, a uh, tear gas canister that pierced his skull. And Safa insisting on being called as the son of his mother, Senwa, Ibn Senwa. And Ibn Senwa actually became a title synonymous of having participated in the October Revolution. So if we take a more, let's say, clear, or perhaps also a more Rancierian approach of the political, that would stay away from a preconceived idea of progress, but rather consider the political as any action that shakes the division of what is perceived, expected, and understood, that defines the demos of democracy as the people of nothing. Then we can see that in mourning those whose, whose life are disposable, 
so easily erased and honoring the marginalized, those who are sustaining life but always put in the background of the domestic becomes a powerful form of dissent and an act of emancipation and subjectivation. And so just to finish also with a more general point, I mean, it is clear that the, this green zone regime is not standing on its own, but that it is constitutive of a military oil capitalist complex that has its root in post-colonial state building and empire. And if carbon democracy refers to a system in which fossil fuels help create the material possibility of the political and economic life of modern democracy in the global north, it has meant something different in the global south. In Iraq, it has historically meant the silencing and repression of democratic forces over decades and war and militarization and the formation of what I call a, uh, I call a carbon kleptocracy. And I think it is very significant that all of the protests in Iraq actually started in El Basra, the province from which most of Iraqi oil is extracted, and a province that totally lacks infrastructure. Basra is one of actually the hottest points on earth uh, ev almost every year in July, with very, very limited state-sponsored electricity and where the water and sewage system are dysfunctional. Some reports actually um, have uh, stated that because of these high temperatures, part of the country, including Baghdad, will be unlivable for humans in the next 30 years. So thinking about the Anthropocene, in a way, pushes us to think of time and space differently. And also look at recorded and deep human his history. I mean, some people talk about going back to the invention of agriculture. And I think that thinking about it uh, in, in Iraq um, is, is, is really actually interesting. It is very relevant also to reflect on the fact that the protesters of the October Revolution are actually mostly from the, the southern region that historically, the deep history, uh, used to be the, the, the fertile crescent. And that many actually protesters are from the marshes, like the, either their parents or their grandparents came from the marshes, where some people have sustained practicing practices of fishing and cultivating that originate in the Sumerian times. People have lived and flourished on these lands for thousands of years, way before the rise of extractivist capitalist modernity. So I suggest that uh, taking Iraq as a framework centering the subjectivities of those whose lives are disposable and so easily erased, demand a political imagination that goes beyond this middle class global north approach of climate justice or climate revolution. And it means also that before we provincialize the human, as it is suggested in the age of the Anthropocene, we take into account how gendered racial extractivist capitalism has practically impacted the lives of some whose precariousness need to be at the center of our political imagination. Thank you, uh, thank you, Nasser, for extending the invitation. Uh, thank you, Zahra, for a wonderful first talk. Um, I would like to start by reflecting on the year-long series that uh, I watched with great interest as well, uh, virtually during our time of confinement. The concept of revolution haunts the Global Uprising series. We begin the series curators tell us in reference to revolution with a concept or question that was at once absent and ever present in our year long series. Our gathering today could then be inscribed under the sign of an insistence or to be more precise of yielding to an insistence of that ever present absentee to be heard. <laughs> 
But why is this the case? Well, because despite all attempts at avoiding a revolution, they tell us, returns as it always seems to do. It could have been expected, and rightly so, after an intense year of collective deliberation around the forms, contents, mediums, strategies, and horizons of the global uprisings of the last decade, that this closing conference will constitute a landing of sorts, an arrival to a destination, even a temporary one. And some, some may always hope, sometimes secretly, for a synthesis that will resolve conflicts, gather the dispersed, and show the way forward. But instead of all of that, we're returning to revolution, returning to the rationale organizing this series, returning to its diagnosis of our present and the modalities of collective political action at work in it and on it. A capping off that is not a conclusion, a closure that brings no resolution, but instead offers a second return. Yes, it is a second return, since an uncanny return is what inaugurates the series itself. If 2020 has so far felt at once strange and eerily familiar, the organizers write in reference to the anti-racist uprisings in the US, it is in part because of it bookends a full decade of open global revolt. Here we are yet again, that year of living dangerously in 210 to 11, so associated with Arab revolts and the Occupy movement has turned out not to be a rupture or exception, they write. Yet there is a difference between both returns, the return of revolution and the return of 210 and 2020. It is from the perspective of 2020 that 210 is resurrected and it is by tying these different ends of the decade together that the present, our present is designated as one of open-ended global uprisings. Revolution on the other hand returns in a different way. It is not a return that establishes the diagnosis of the present as one of global uprising. Rather, it is a return that comes to trouble that particular diagnosis of the present. Revolution returns as a return of the repressed, so the double that haunts uprising. Could the series have been alternatively called global revolution? The organizers allow, allude to an answer via a recourse to a double negative. It's too easy and facile to describe our times as post-revolutionary times, they tell us. And uprisings ought to be thought outside of a cyclical perspective of repetitions which do not leave their mark on the world. I read them as telling us that revolution as a turning upside down of the world, a sejura in the fabric of time, an act of founding as a new beginning, may be too much for des describing our present. But the notion of uprising as a succession of near explosions that erupt every now and then before petering out without transforming our, our world is too little. It is in this space that is less than revolution as we knew it and more than uprising as a near cyclical outburst that the series sought to diagnose the present as global uprising. And it is under understandable why they would lean towards rethinking uprising rather than revolution. Too much hangs on whether the name revolution is bestow bestowed on something or not. A brief glance on the academic literature produced on the Arab revolutions, Zahra mentioned the revolution a minute ago, as well as the political debates surrounding them is enough to prove the point. And too much hangs on articulating a narrative of their successes, their failures, their defeat, their tragedy. While uprisings, on the other hand, are a more malleable form, and they are not a priori on the side of emancipatory politics, as recent debates around the ideological colors of the <laughs> Gilets Jaunes movement in France. No worries. Are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> I'm very sensitive. 
Oh yeah. Put too much hangs on articulating a narrative of the successes, failures, and defeats of revolution. While uprisings, on the other hand, are a more malleable form, they are, and they are not a priori on the side of emancipatory politics, as recent debates around the ideological colors of the Gilets Jaunes movement in France, are they on the left, are they on the right, remind us. Revolutions are also a matter of historical processes and revolutionary consciousness. The search for the revolutionary collective subject has occupied revolutionary thinkers as different as Herbert Marcuse and Franz Fanon when the posited mediation between theory and practice was severed in the 20th century. Fanon's Wretched of the Earth were, as Dipesh Chakrabarty points out, like Mao's peasant and Gramsci's subaltern. And here I cite, part of the search for a revolutionary subject that was not the proletariat in the absence of a large working class, which was in it itself an exercise in a series of displacements of the original term. It is also worth noting here that the wretched of the earth is the proletariat double. Fanon picks it from the first verse of the French international, Debout les de la terre, releases it from it and rewires it to make it stand for those not assimilated to the colonial world and whose bodies bear its front, elevating them to the historic role of the primary revolutionary agent. But perhaps it is revolution as a collective singular, as Reinhard Koselik observed, and as, as which, and we, which he noted, appeared to unite within itself the course of all individual revolutions, transforming it into a meta-historical concept that assumed a transcendental signification, which is especially significant for us. Why so? Because uprisings more often than not appear in the plural. They are usually dispersed, local, not necessarily connected or informing one another, like the ideas of revolution and world revolution. But the series elevated them to the rank of, of a collective singular. In its opening statement, it affirmed that uprising, not uprisings, is our present. At an age when history with a capital H no longer offers any guarantees like it did for past generations of revolutionaries, who believe that their sacrifices will one day be vindicated and their opponents will end up in the dustbin of history. And in this day and age, when the promise of futurity as emancipation recedes from view and that of the future as catas catastrophe gains a stronger hold on minds, whether in the accelerated form of a nuclear disaster or the slower one of the graduate eradication of life on the planet, is the diagnosis of our present as global uprising borrowing its collective singular form from the old concept of revolution? Is it a displacement that seeks to account for a time of revolution, not only unshackled from the historicist stagism, but more importantly, without the sense of futurity that accompanies it? What do we do with the big concepts like revolution with an appetite for totality that seem to have outlived the modern regime of historicity they were an, an integral part of? And when their terrain of, of political, when their political and social terrains of operation have been radically transformed. Political revolutions that change regimes and social revolutions that upend the social fabric belong to a past like the one that President Abdel Nasser inhabited. He drew on this dual notion of revolution in his book, The Philosophy of the Revolution. Nasser pointed out the necessity of both and the tensions between them, since political revolution needs the, co the cohesion of the nation against the colonizer to achieve its liberation. And social revolution entails a struggle internal to the nation for the sake of greater equality amongst its citizens. But today our understanding of the political, the social and power more generally has been expanded to encompass, so, to encompass so much more than nation and class in their classical sense. Decades ago, the feminist tradition stretched the notion of the political to encompass the private sphere. The concept of work was also widened in the late 20th century outside of its traditional association with labor movements. Progressive advocates and at Singh rights expanded the concept of work and thus the grounds for solidarity arguing that housework, sex work, peace work, and more were also work. And more generally, Wendy Brown underscored how the operations, mechanics, circulation, logics, venues, and vehicles of power have been reconceived. 
And to that, we can add that the category of the citizen can no longer be assumed to be the implicit subject of political practice. To do so is to foreclose migrants, refugees, and asylum seekers from the sphere of emancipatory political practice. My, my wager has always been as much conceptual as it was political, the theories and concepts, instead of adjudicating political practice, ought to be rethought in light of it. This is why I have criticized the positions of some quarters of the left, both Arab and Western, that sought to banish Arab revolutionaries of the past decade from the domain of emancipatory practice via recourse to reified ideological first principles, such as secularism, or anti-imperialism, by which they meant an opposition to US foreign policy and the West more generally. Rethinking revolution today entails rethinking what it means to be on the left, beyond an adherence to contextless ideological first principles and main contradictions. But rethinking revolution as well entails rethinking the taken for granted coupling of revolutions with founding fathers, Lenin and Russia, Mao and China, and the many fathers of the Palestinian revolution, for example. Rethinking revolution entails as well, rethinking the question of violence at a time when both the memory of past harms, as well as healing, repairing, and the life-sustaining labor of care define the contours of our present. And finally, rethinking revolution entails rethinking political commitment and practice when history no longer constitutes a secularization of a theodicy and we can no longer be sure that brighter futures await us all. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Um, thanks to Jim and Nasser for this kind invitation. It's really great to be at my first in-person academic event in over two years. Totally surreal. Very great to be on a panel with Raha and Thady and Sarah. Um, my thoughts here on the question of revolution are shaped by recent work I've been doing on the cultural and intellectual history of modern and contemporary Syria reflections on the revolutionary vanguardism, so-called, as it was contested, created, and institutionalized in state-administered and non-state spaces during the period of Assadist Ba'athist rule from 1970 to the near present, specifically the realms of intellectual life, literature, and cinema. And so in a sense, I'm going to reflect here on the story I tell in the forthcoming book, Revolution's Aesthetic. I'll take this time to step back think about the analytical and methodological challenges in trying to make critical historical sense of the phenomenon, the concept, the rhetoric, but also the political practice of revolution, in a sense, trying to square the circle here between what Zahra was talking about and what Fed was talking about. I'm interested in this question in two particular ways, one having to do with the nature of Assadist Ba'athist rule over the course of nearly half a century, and on the other hand, the way in which the question intersects specifically with the Syrian uprising of 2011, to reconsider the struggle over the historical significance of the uprising itself in the light of our prompt. And not to continue to ask whether or not these events constituted a revolution, but also to place the uprising in, and uprisings in a longer history of the idea of revolution itself. Our prompt asks us to consider the question, how might we move beyond the use of revolution as a qualifying judgment and instead open it onto events like the Arab revolts in their own prehistories? As a way of jumping into the discussion in order to set the scene in a way that I hope will clarify what it is we're trying to do here, I'd like to start with a brief quotation. On May 28th, 2021, the day after winning re-election with an improbable 95% of the vote, and nearly a decade after the eruption of the Syrian uprising, President Bashar al-Assad directly addressed those who had supported him in his bid for re-election, saying in a televised address, quote, you all have redefined patriotism, which means that you have also automatically redefined treason. The difference between the two is comparable to the difference between what is called the revolution of revolutionaries, Thawrat Thawar, I might translate it slightly differently as revolutionary revolution to emphasize the redundancy of the term 
being invoked here. And on the other hand, what Assad called the revolution of bulls, or perhaps beasts of burden, Thaurat Sudan. Speaking analogically for Assad, the difference between these two types is, quote, much like the difference between a revolutionary who is imbued with honor and a bull or beast of burden, chewing its cud between a revolutionary who is uh, on a path of glory and pride and a bull or a beast of burden who seeks humiliation and shame, between a revolutionary who bows down before his creator and a bull who snorts while prostrating itself in the face of the almighty dollar, close quote. There's a great deal to chew on in this address. Swiftly appropriating the mantle of revolution and religion somehow, Assad cast those who oppose the regime and its soi disant revolutionary agenda as animals, dishonorable, insincere, treasonous, and materially self-interested. Thought it worth beginning with this evocative quote because it neatly permits me to isolate two points I want to make. First, and this is uh, relevant to some of Fadi's remarks, the struggle over the very identity, meanings, and consequences of the Syrian revolution. Is it a revolution? Was it a revolution? What is a revolution? Regardless of the perceived analytical value of those questions, continues to animate both state and non-state actors in Syria and outside of Syria. Second, the quote is particularly striking to me in the light of the intellectual and cultural history of Ba'athist Syria I've been thinking about over the past few years. Language and tone and ideology are invoked in these remarks that are remarkably consistent with the revolutionary vanguardism so-called under Hafez al-Assad, wherein revolution, struggle, and heroism were standard elements in the discursive and ideological making and remaking of rule. Indeed, in the construction of what might be called a discourse of counter-revolutionary revolution. So I want to raise some questions now about the relevance of the Syrian case to the emergent revolutionary theory or theories of revolution in relation to the Arab uprisings, if the terms are indeed worth retaining. Must the Syrian uprising and the Syrian regime remain exceptions to the rule when it comes to discussions of the Arab uprisings? Is there a Syrian exception, a term that has been invoked in other contexts but continues to kind of haunt our conversation here? That term has a history, in other words, and it is often invoked to describe other world historical contexts in this region, of course, that would also entail Libya, Yemen, and perhaps other places. Conversely, analytically speaking, can the political, intellectual, cultural history of modern and contemporary Syria contribute at all to this debate on revolutionary theory or theories of revolution? There's been a fair amount of discussion about how the Syrian revolution has been received, understood, embraced, or rejected in regional and international terms. Let's think about Fadi's, I think, elegant invocation of the notion of an anti-imperialist transcendentalism. I think you alluded to it just now, and I, we could talk more about its relevance here. But there's been less attention paid to how the Syrian revolution itself has or has not shaped the conditions of rule and talk about rule, the politics of language, in other words, in Syria. There is a wonderful exception, a 2018 book by Ilaf Badr-Din um, on the topic of when they chanted for eternity, the language of the Syrian revolution. Those of you who are interested, that's um, in Arabic. The language of state power on display in Bashar al-Assad's remarks is grounded, in other words, in political, ethical, and mo even moral claims about revolutionary thought, action, and imagination. And it's worth noting to take a, a broader historical view that there is some kind of strange resonance with what we might call the animalistic language found in earlier Orientalist tropes about revolution in the Middle East and Islamic world. One might think immediately of the claims made by Bernard Lewis famously in his 1972 essay on Islamic concepts of revolution, critiqued famously by Edward Said and many, many others about the Arabic term, Arabic term thawra, among other terms that are invoked in this piece, not referring to a revolution as such, but rather to the rising up of a bestirred camel. Through a reductive semantic analysis, Lewis argued that revolution is inimical to Islam, broadly conceived, and the Near East only slightly more restrictedly understood. Many have lambasted this set of claims for its cloistered view of Arabic language itself, failure to recognize how languages evolve, but also, and perhaps most importantly, racist and Islamophobic arguments about whether peoples of the Arabic-speaking world are capable of revolution or revolutionary 
My point here is not to belabor a critique of Bernard Lewis, not to take pot shots at Bashar al-Assad, but there does seem to be something subversive, I hope, and I hope more so generative in placing these two characters in the same frame in order to call attention to the politics of language itself, the politics of naming something or someone, someone's a revolution or revolutionary. One thing that's less often noted, and this is particularly relevant to my own interest here, is that Lewis extended his argument to identify a discourse of what he called revolution reaction, which is a term that I don't think has a particularly broad currency, but is worth thinking about here as we try to rethink not only the politics, histories, and possible futures of revolution, but also counter-revolution. So here I will just now elaborate briefly on the two points I've introduced and then I'll close. The first point I'm trying to make is that we need to be attentive to the rhetorical construction of revolution, its related vocabularies, the symbolic significance of revolution. This is not to challenge the focus on social movements, labor activism, spontaneous grassroots mobilization, climate crisis, and many of the uh, other issues that I think Zahra brilliantly introduced for us here in the Iraqi context, but another way to complement our understanding of the Arab uprisings. Asif Bayat, who has not been mentioned, but his work has clearly been evoked by both of my co-panelists now, differentiates between revolution as process and revolution as change, differentiating indeed those types of revolutionary moments from revolution. Revolution highlights brief quote here, the revolutionary movements that emerged to compel the incumbent regimes to reform themselves, close quote. In other words, revolution still somehow seems to be about consequences and not about intent. In other words, a revolutionary movement or a revolutionary intellectual might well wind up having a role in a reformist or a revolutionary outcome and agenda. Bayat and others, more broadly speaking, have staged an important discussion about a possible fifth generation revolutionary theory in historical sociology, emphasizing nonviolent and non hierarchical horizontalist forms of uprising. The key insight here, it seems to me, is to move the discussion of revolution away from the straitjacket of success and failure and into the realm of lived experience and the possibility of new horizons of expectation. As I like again also discernible in language. Many scholars use the Syrian case, moreover, as a cautionary tale or an exception, as I said, that proves the rule about the Arab uprising somehow. For Bayad, the failure or the quashing, those are his terms, of revolutionary movements in Syria and Libya can be understood in terms of what Bayad writes is the extraordinary intervention of foreign forces that radically altered the nonviolent trajectories of those revolutions into devastating armed conflicts. Bayat is certainly correct that the unraveling of Syria into a state of domestic and regional conflict, a war that has displaced, let us recall, over half of the country internally and internationally, as well as led to the death of over half a million people, has made it more complicated to explore the evolution and consequences of the Syrian uprising itself, which quickly became subsumed by the larger Syria war. But does this not somehow unwittingly echo the language of the regime itself of Bashar al-Assad's point about revolutionary bulls that were enticed by the promise of money or other forms of recompense by foreign forces? Beyond the material defeats suffered by the Syrian revolution, must its aspirations also now be lost amid the chaos and destruction of the Syria war? There's still much more to be considered, and I have no easy answer for any of these questions, in terms of how revolution, but also I emphasize counter-revolution, indeed what might be thought of as counter-revolutionary revolution are defined. How the language of revolution has been repackaged and repurposed in the service of counter-revolutionary, even reactionary aims. Second point, our thinking about revolution in the age of the Arab uprisings could benefit from a historical reconsideration of the rhetoric of revolution in earlier periods. One fruitful way to get at this question, it seems to me, would be to not only focus on revolutionary movements themselves, but also to think about how that discourse and rhetoric travels in and through the mechanics of state building and other uh, regime-driven practices in post-colonial situations such as Syria. 
My recent work explores how the revolutionary discourses of Ba'athism itself became institutionalized in a repressive regime from the 1970s onward, that it once promoted revolution abroad, sought to also promote the language of revolution at home, while also stifling dissent in a reactionary counter-revolutionary mode. Perhaps Taurar Jaiya, to borrow from Bernard Lewis, may be relevant. The institutionalization of what is called the revolution in broad strokes in Ba'athist Syria, in a way that it is comparable to other world historical revolutionary regimes, think of Algeria, Cuba, Vietnam, perhaps there are other or better comparative cases, raises questions about our understanding of revolution with a capital R, its histories, its aims, its possible futures. I'll invoke the work of Brecht de Smet, who nicely encapsulates this puzzle from the Egyptian perspective by encouraging us to think about what de Smet calls the agency of counter-revolution, exercised by individuals, networks, and institutions articulated through concrete actions, imprisonment, torture, intimidation, co-optation. Also, however, through language, propaganda, media, cultural production, so forth. I find useful the way Dismet interprets Gramscian notions such as passive revolution and what he calls revolution restoration, borrowing from Gramsci. And I, I would note the resonance here with the term, again, revolution reaction. Revolution restoration in Dismet's reading can either mean, quote, elite engineered social and political reform that draws on foreign capital and associated ideas while lacking a national popular base. And, quote, how a revolutionary form of political transformation is pressed into a conservative project of restoration, but is linked to insurrectionary mass mobilization from below, close quote. I would put this line of argument into conversation with the discourse on revolution that in order for us to think about other potential analytical entry points and exit points from what might be a stalled discussion, as I think Fadi was maybe starting to allude to. In, the, in, in my forthcoming book, I tackle related questions from the time of the corrective movement, the coup that brought Hafez al-Assad to power. I track what I call a cultural revolution, an Assadist Ba'athist cultural revolution that was promulgated by the regime throughout this period. Part and parcel of the country's transformation under the sway of a self-proclaimed revolutionary vanguard, implementing a certain melange of Ba'athist theory and practice developed earlier in the 1960s, the state then pursued a broad agenda to remake Syrian intellectual and cultural life in the image of the vanguardism and commitment of this Assadist Ba'athist cultural revolution. One brief note about this concept of Assadism, which would become a term used both analytically and vernacularly, at first in Arabic, but what has typically been called Assadism or Assadiyya typically referred more restrictedly to political Assadism. That is to say, the system of clientelist rule institutionalized through the cultivation of patronage networks and social pacts. Political Assadism, though, was accompanied by consonant policies and practices I refer to as cultural Assadism. State led Assadist Ba'athist cultural revolution an attempt to institutionalize a hegemonic aesthetic ideology and its related leader cult through cultural means is legible in periodicals, public culture, cultural production. I argue that this aesthetic ideology could be adapted, challenged, and evaded by Syrian artists, writers, filmmakers, and intellectuals. In general terms, the struggle for aesthetic power, value, and taste is at the heart of the cultural history of Ba'athist Syria, which must be related to our conversation here about the nature of revolutionary transformation and the imagination of alternative possible futures. In the book, I do not seek to render a verdict on the reality or validity of this cultural revolution. Instead, I establish a term I should point out is for the most part, not used as a term of art throughout this period. This is an analytical tool that I am using. 
I established some of the aesthetic ideological grounds on which the cultural field became a site of agonistic struggle. And I can offer more empirical examples of the kinds of people I have in mind here. While the idea was to build an entirely new society around the trinity of Arab unity, liberty, and socialism, the spread and absorption of Ba'athist ideology was uneven and took different forms in the political, the military, the cultural, and the intellectual spheres. In the wake of the corrective movement, Assad's Ba'athist cultural revolution entailed the state-driven attempt to promote a new aesthetic ideology, what I refer to as an aesthetics of power, a shift that built upon earlier conceptions of revolution overturning, overcoming political commitment and other ideas, but redefining and repackaging those keywords in line with the aspirations of Assadis Ba'athist um, regime's quest for political domination and cultural hegemony. Let me sum up what I am trying to say. Scholars can historicize the language of revolution, struggle, and heroism without necessarily conceptualizing language or discourse as untethered from political and economic reality. Bashar al-Assad's address in May of 2021 is emblematic of how the Ba'athist regime in Syria has policed the language of struggle and resistance while remaining wrapped in its own ideological universe. Certain institutions of rule, the army, the party, the bureaucracy, the state media, the cultural apparatus, the state security services, foreign capital, have all been central in shaping Syrian political, intellectual, and cultural life for over half a century. This played out in different ways, to be sure, at different times. During the era, the era of Hafez al-Assad, through the period of so-called reformism from above, under Bashar, and into the time of the Syria war. I think it's crucial to um, keep in mind that reaching a deeper understanding of these discourses of social change, economic justice, and political transformation in Syria um, might be a necessary step towards a better understanding of and reckoning with revolution, revolutions, and revolutionary theory in the age of Arab uprising. Okay, wow, thank you everyone. Thank you all three of you. Those are amazing uh, presentations. Um, um, so I'm uh, really, I just wanna uh, first see before we open up to the audience, uh, you know, what these three might have to say in response to each other or, um, you know, whether they're particular um, concepts or, um, you know, uh, any particular conversations uh, anyone wants to have uh, first. I mean, I might throw out, I mean, that's a lot to try to get my head around, but I want, might throw out a few um, just links that people could pick up on or not, um, but any of you could also just pursue, you know, if, you want, if there's anything you want to respond to. Um, I was struck um, in both Zahra and uh, Fadi's uh, presentations about the concept of the political, right, and, and um, sort of in particular, in terms of uh, feminist um, uh, rethinking of the political or broadenings of the political, I heard that in both of those uh, presentations. And um, Zahra, you started out uh, talking about um, sort of the you know inadequacy of theoretical concepts, um, uh, talking about what what revolution should look like in Iraq. Um, you mentioned women's rights as one of those. Um, so I wonder if you want to say a little bit more about that in terms of what you were talking about later in terms of. Uh, women's involvement as subjects of revolution in Iraq during the October Revolution, uh, maybe in relation to this concept. Okay. Um, <laughs> what? It's scary to hold it, right? <laughs> Gives me a chance to look at my notes for a second. Should I just keep talking? Um, okay, and, and then maybe also um, in those first two presentations, um, the question of, of theory and practice and, um, you know, Zahra, you talked about, you know, using categories of analysis that are, you know, coming out of the protests themselves. 
Um, and I wonder if you could maybe just, again, you know, pick up on whatever this is interesting to you, but um, if you could maybe just go a little bit farther with that. And um, do you also see, um, what ways and do you also see theory as coming out of those protests um, in a way that could speak back to some of the, the categories that you were criticizing in the beginning uh, more explicitly? I know that's what you were doing, but um, um, I was wondering about that. Um, and then uh, for, um, uh, I mean, some of that I already asked for uh, Fadi. Some of the questions I think were embedded in that for Fadi, because you also mentioned this feminist sort of broadening of the political. Um, uh, you know, there's a lot in there. Um, you know, I wonder what you think of sort of uh, that was a conversation with Zahra on one hand, but in conversation with Max, um, kind of thinking about, um, or, or any of you thinking about the state, right? Max talked about state more explicitly, and I don't think any of you would think of the state as this coherent, homogeneous entity, but the state in relation to revolution. Because Fadi brought up Kasselik's, um, Reinhard Kasselik's uh, concept about revolution in the singular, assuming a trans-historical significance, right? And part of that in Kasselik is, is then the way in which revolution, which is part of what I understand Max is talking about, that revolution that um, um, becomes, oh, I can't remember exactly how Kasselik frames it, but I think it's right after he talks about revolution assumes a trans-historical significance, and that's how it gets picked up by the state. So that to become counter-revolutionary becomes to be against the state, right? Which is exactly what we see in, you know, Bathurst, Iraq, where, um, where the state just takes on revolution and the counter-revolutionaries are the people who oppose the state. So I don't know if anyone wants to say anything more about this relation of revolution with, with the state. Um, you know, there's a question of organization, uh, which, which, you know, the, um, I mean, uh, Zahra talked about, um, you know, these spaces, um, the spaces of protest in Baghdad and, um, uh, you know, I mean, during the October Revolution in general, Basra also. Um, you know, the subjects of revolution on the one hand and, and then the organ organization, um, how we think about organization in relation to this, um, uh, I don't want to say hopeless future, but this problem of the future that was brought up at least in the first two presentations, right, of climate disaster, of, um, you know, we're no longer talking at all about linear modernization theories of the future, you know, at all, but in what way then are, are do you want to say anything more about organization in terms of um, how, how um, the future is being uh, thought about? Um, and then, I mean, and also in relation to what Max was saying in terms of revolution, you know, I mean, you know, going into conversation with Bayet and others, but revolutionary experience from below, um, this nonviolent, non-hierarchical, um, you know, these are also kind of organizational um, questions. Um, so these are a couple, a couple kind of uh, themes that I saw uh, circulating um, uh, between the uh, different presentations. But of course, there's a lot more. So um, I'm just going to stop there and, and see what you want to respond to, either in what I said or just in um, uh, things I didn't pick up on and what the other presenters talked about. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, uh, Sarah. Uh, so, I mean, there's so many things I, I, I would like to say, but I also don't want to speak for, for too long and also like uh, leave space for the audience to ask questions. But so, a point that I'm making, which is a very important point for me, uh, that I also kind of made a little bit in my in my book, Women and Gender in Iraq, which is about um, questioning in looking at the very materiality, uh, as opposed to, I mean, not as opposed, I mean, the discursive also contain materiality, but often um, it, it's to break with this idea, okay, what are they saying? What are they asking for? What are they demanding, right? And as if protests, and, and this is why I actually I'll, I'll also use the, the term protest because it's much much more concrete in a way than, than digging into other terms. So protest actually, I mean, if you look at political science type of, of, of view of protest, okay, this is, you know, this is an agenda. Is this agenda and is this list of demands, uh, uh, does it correspond to some, you know, particular ideology, et cetera, et cetera. So, and in, 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 in relation, I think, to uh, women and gender, I think, the point that I want to make is, so if, you, if we limit ourselves uh, um, in thinking about um, a woman's rights agenda within this protest, uh, we are actually going to be frustrated and we're going to see that uh, what, is, what comes out of, of the protest uh, uh, is actually also contradictory in many ways. So there are slogans, for example, uh, that were very uh, woman-centered and that really challenge patriarchal gender norms, but there are also, uh, there's also, and, and, and I'm thinking because I've, I've studied for so long feminist activism in Iraq and, and seeing, for example, 
that um, established feminist activists decided when they participated in the October Revolution uh, to set up, for example, an Iraqi tent rather than a feminist tent can also sound as anti-feminist, anti right? It can, it can also sound the fact that most of the, I mean, the women who participated in, in, in the October Re Revolution defined their participation saying, we are here to honor the martyrs and did not define the participation as we are here for a particular woman's right agenda, right? Is, is for me very, very uh, uh, important to analyze. And, 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 and showing something that actually looks contradictory if we are taking a frame of women's rights that, that is very uh, limited and limiting. Uh, uh, whereas if you actually look at emancipation and forms of subjectivation, if you expand your understanding of the political, you can really understand how, how ra radical this is to come in Tahrir Square and say, I'm not here as a woman, I'm here to honor the martyrs, right? So this is what I'm, the kind of, of reading that I'm trying to, to, to dig into in, in, in also looking at uh, body politics, at space, uh, uh, because I mean, the post-2003 uh, uh, um, public space has been privatized, militarized, so opening this space uh, um, um, and, and women's very presence in this space, active presence in this space through traditional roles and non-traditional roles is, is, is really something that, uh, has been experienced as a as a radical change, uh, so so that's that's the aspect and and and, and really questioning when we talk about women's uh, rights, not only focusing on issues of I don't know the personal status code or uh, on on legal or the juridic dimension of rights, but really looking at the materiality of the kind of lives uh, people are able to live. So. Uh, um, uh, being able to circulate within a space, being able to access to certain resources, health, education, being able to have electricity, water, all of this also should be included in our imaginary of rights. So, so in, in focusing on the materiality, on space, on time, on, on, on body politics, I, I really want to go beyond uh, um, rights discourses, basically. Um, so, um, also on uh, your, your question about the state and, and, and kind of protest movement or uprisings or revolution that happened before, what, what I find very interesting in the October Revolution is that it act actually mixes up different legacies and that it's, it's, it's very difficult to, um, to, to put some order in these legacies because you have, for example, uh, I, I mean, I, I could hear in, 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 in the South, for example, in Nasriye, uh, slogans or, or actually religious, I mean, Lokmiyat, religious chanting that were actually used uh, during the um, 1991 uprising against the Saddam's regime. You also have uh, uh, protesters that use references to Thawrat Tashrin, the 1920s revolution against the British, right? So you have all of these kind of, of legacies uh, that are that are appropriated and used in different ways and sometimes in contradictory ways in the squares of protest. And it's I think I mean it's also important to acknowledge them as they are without trying necessarily to put order in 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 them. Um, yes, I, I don't want to talk for too long. So I, I... All right. Uh, thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Zahra. These are very, I mean, the questions are helping me sort of clarify what I was thinking about in the paper. So let me try and answer them in a way that sort of tries to recap what I've been trying to think about. Um, the question of the political, which is basically at the heart of uh, Zahra's talk, is um, how do we how how do we reimagine re the political to basically um, not foreclose a priori certain practices or certain ideas as falling outside of the domain of emancipatory politics is I think key to understanding what happens in Iraq, what happened in Lebanon, and what happened in the past in the past decade precisely because. Uh, of some reified principles that are used to sort of excommunicate people from 
the domain of sort of emancipatory political practice. And uh, as old Marxists used to say, it's not a coincidence that the main counter-revolutionary discourse is the discourse of tahwin, of accusing people in Iraq, in Lebanon, in Egypt, that they are agents of foreign embassies. The word NGO has become an insult. And that's common across the board. And in that, there's a very, very, it's something that Maxime Rodinson called uh, a long time ago an ideology implicit, an implicit ideology, which is, keeps on reproducing itself, which is how do you sort of like excommunicate people from the domain of political, uh, Arab nationalists use it, Islamists use it, Marxists use it, Mumala today uses it. It's the idea of sort of basically telling people that you are on the outside, therefore, you know, you do not represent, it's good to fight against you. And then, you know, in sort of more extreme cases, get rid of you either physically or at least intellectually. So, so there is something I think at, when, when, we are, when we think about the discourse of the queen and of the accusation of treason, we realize in a way the modes of operation of trying to sort of uh, stand against this imagination of the political. Uh, 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 something that Max said, which, which I think is very illuminating that has to do with the question of the state is that from the perspective of the regimes, uh, the Arab revolutions are counter-revolutions. They are counter-revolutions because precisely these uh, regimes that have basically founded themselves in the wake of decolonization and that were mostly sort of military coups called themselves revolutions and sought to institute revolution as the idiom through which to basically legitimize themselves. And in and there's much at stake, I think, in sort of the people who were protesting and reclaiming revolution, I think, is an act of reappropriating of something that was taken away from them. And here it's not a coincidence as well that in a place like Lebanon, where there were no military coups, the other concept that flanks revolution is civil war. So what you have is basically one way of thinking of revolution. One way of thinking of revolution is as we've done in this series in terms of revolution and uprising, but there's another way of thinking of revolution, which is basically as a concept that's flanked by military coups on the one hand and civil wars on the other hand. And the regime in Lebanon always threatens of civil war whenever people go on the street trying to sort of rethink the question of the political. So, so this is, you know, for about, you know, sort of concerning your question about, um, about the state. Um, I'll end with the first point you mentioned, uh, Sarah, which is the sort of uh, the concept of the political. This is something I struggle with myself. I don't have an answer to it, but if you look at social movements and critical theory for the past three decades, four decades, one of the main moves that this theory does is that it basically widens concepts. Mm -hmm. The political is expanded, power is expanded, social is expanded, work is expanded to sort of like incorporate certain practices that were not thought to fall within the domain of the political, the social, and work. Which is why I drew, I sort of brought up uh, Gamal Abdel Nasser's philosophy of revolution. Because at that point, it was clear what the political meant and what the social meant. But in a, in a day and age where basically our concepts of what work constitutes, what is the social, what is the political, what is power, has been winded so much, how can, what kind of impact does our reimagining of these concepts have on a concept like revolution? It's a very big question. I don't have an, uh, an answer to it, but I wanted to sort of uh, put it on the table if we're really trying to think that, um, you know, these questions. I mean, one way of phrasing that would be to sort of think the impact of thinking intersectionally on revolution. But I think there is, there is something here which is precisely because revolution is not malleable as a form like uprising there's something i think here which needs to be sort of taken into uh, into consideration and the other point was the question of uh, of of the of the future so there is the the concepts organizing revolution including the political and and the sort of you know koselik mentions something very interesting which is the idea that sometimes revolution and reform what they both have in what they both have in, in common is the idea of a planning of a particular future. 
and 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 that idea of sort of not even thinking about progress or teleology or etc but even the idea of sort of uh, planning the future is something which i think has become troubled to say to, to say the least i'll pick up on something that fadi just said um it's interesting that the entire discussion thus far seems to be uh, well beyond the straitjacket of uh, revolution as outcome or revolution as as event and more about revolution as process, but also revolution as opportunity or provocation to thinking. And I think that's to the good. Uh, one aspect of that, um, if instead of framing this as revolution as process, but thinking about revolution as struggle, struggle for emancipation, struggle for liberation, in addition to the question of what kind of emancipation, emancipation of the individual subject, emancipation of a society, emancip emancipation of, of humanity in some broad sense. Something that Zahra said put me in mind of this analytical problem between the, um, call it the materiality of revolution as opposed to its subjectivities. Um, and I, I thought your invocation of the term subjectivity might um, merit some more discussion. What is the place of subjectivity? Is this a conceptual category that we want to continue to work with? Um, regardless of how one comes down on that question, I do think the dichotomization of the experiential dynamic, the affective nature of one's encounter with the revolutionary opportunity, moment, event, speaks to a much larger problem, which is a shift from what was once called the political. The expansion, as Fadi was just saying, this was the point I wanted to pick up on, the expansion of the possibility for emancipatory, um, uh, an emancipated life seems to have moved in a direction uh, away from the ideological or the more strictly defined political and towards something not only affective, but akin to the moral and I'm trying to figure out what to do with that. The shift towards a discourse on dignity, the shift towards a discourse on death and the kind of deathly materiality of clamoring for change puts us in a very different um, world. And, and, and I, I would argue a darker world, not only because we're talking about death, a darker world in the sense that we have retreated in some sense into the personal, the embodiment of suffering, martyrdom, struggle makes sense from a particular perspective, an outsider perspective, a bird's eye view perspective of this suffering, which acquires symbolic meaning, which circulates in different cultural spheres. But in terms of the embodied experience itself, one which can never be fully processed by an external observer, we are moving into a very different domain. It does not necessarily prevent the conditions of possibility for solidarity, social solidarity of a different kind emerging, but it does have a premise that is quite distinct from one in which the disembodied, all-knowing, rational subject views the unfolding of history with a kind of revolutionary potential. So I just wanted to point out that there's there's something there that is troubling and perhaps can interrupt the conversation in a slightly different way than has been mentioned so far. In that um, connection, this is the last thing I'll say, um, another point that Reinhard Kaselik makes in that piece on revolution, which I find both um, useful and troubling and perhaps invalidating of our entire use of the term is that he asks the question, I think quite appropriately, um, what is there, I'm paraphrasing, what is there in the world that could not be subject to revolutionary effects? Okay, if that is the case that everything is revolutionizable, then revolution is a meaningless concept and it's not totally clear other than the empirical, what we are to do with with revolution as a, as a concept. So the transcendentalism of the concept is put into question by that claim is what I meant to say. Uh, that is all I have to say right now. Um, thank you so much for your really interesting presentations. And I hope I don't start us off with a really awkward question. Um, but I've been thinking a lot lately about um, the, um, the invisibility of materiality. Um, and we're concluding with this question of materiality and bodily experience as part of thinking about revolutions. But so much of our lives today are about that invisible materiality. And I'm thinking of 
strategies used by software like Pegasus, right, that um, lead, you know, to the experience of death of someone like Khashoggi, right? So to me, that kind of question of where those um, technologies of surveillance that um, are so critical to experiences of revolution play a role in your thinking. Thank you very much for the talk. Um, the question is not very clear for me, but I mean, I just want to put it, I would love to hear more. Uh, what do you think? Uh, I'll take it off from what Max, I mean, all the definitions that he put, like how can we think revolution? And he ended with, you know, the provocation that maybe revolution is actually a youth system. So what are we doing with it? Then how can we also think about revolution as diagnosing, like diagnosing a certain present? And I'm interested in, the, we're talking about the long decade between 2010 and 2020. 2010, the response was reclaiming space, what uh, Zahra was saying, and we saw that in Iraq, into the, the shift into reclaiming life, in this politics of life. So maybe we could talk about also uh, what Fadi was saying about talking about revolution as a singular, but um, in the description of the event, how can we also start thinking about the different presence that we occupy and the different presence that a concept of revolution could actually diagnose and help us think through. Okay. Maybe something that um, I think I have two quasi questions. I'm not sure they're the status of questions yet, but that kind of builds on what Safi said. And, and thank you all. This is incredibly, incredibly generative. Um, one, first of all, uh, just maybe to think about a, a certain kind of space of tension that that emerges from um, from your readings, from all three readings, I think. On the one hand, um, this sense that uh, revolution in Fadi's terms has sort of exceeded its own historicity, its own, and by extension, its own futurity, which Sarah also mentioned, the end of the modernization project, which seems to to have a very kind of close relationship to how we thought about revolution, this kind of, um, you know, movement of universal history on the one hand, right? The sense that there's something that's stale about the term, that's straight jacketing about it, that's almost expired about it. And on the other hand, the same time, um, the fact that it's so jealously guarded, right? And both what Max was talking about in terms of, you know, it's continued use by, what's left of you know the post-colonial states and that you know which i think we'll get into in the next session but you know that kind of afterlife it's continued resonance it's continued use but also you can see it beyond the post-colonial state i mean you can see the way a certain sense of french republicanism uh you know i.e racism continues to invoke a kind of revolutionary uh heritage right or lineage um and you can see it, of course, in, in what all three of you touched upon in the academic literature, right? The, 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 the adjudication of what is and what isn't revolution. Um, but there is, on the other side of this, which I think is also what, what, what I want to get at with the second question, you know, how do we think about this tension? Um, there is also within this the continued use or incitement that people make you know, for revolution on the streets themselves, right? That somehow it's not a concept um that has for people uh exceeded its it's in a very kind of you know basic sense exceeded its use exceeded its social life and i don't i don't really know how to think about that kind of uh that tension or opposition um the second question i wanted to kind of peg on to that it's maybe in a in a bit more kind of direct sense um which is you know how do we um how do we relate to that tension and you know, um, going back to kind of what we began with, which is how do we think the relationship um, between concept here and struggle? If it's if it's not as I understand from all of you, it's not to adjudicate, it's not to give order to the messiness. Um, but how do we kind of maybe this is what 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 diagnostics mean? But how how do we how do we read a certain content in the use of revolution today? Right. Um, beyond, you know, the kind of the meta, the meta that we're we're kind of all wading into, right? But how do we give it a certain? If 
the kind of transition that mass large scale transition that was associated with the revolution, the splitting of the armed forces, these kind of images, right? These, these processes that, what do we, what, what content does revolution have to do? And maybe it's subjectivity. I don't know. Maybe that's, that's, you know, that's the best we can get with a revolutionary process. I mean, for all of the, for all of the critique of, uh, you know, Bayat's book and stuff like that, I think part of that kind of grappling is also a, a kind of impasse that, you know, is reached in, the, well, there isn't revolution the way it used to look like, and we can't just pretend whatever we want is revolution. So, you know, it's revolution without revolutionaries, or even in the literature that came out of that, that inverted that to say, it's actually it's revolutionaries without revolution. You're, you're at the same impasse in a way. Um, and and I wonder if if you know, our job is not to adjudicate struggle, what we can what we can read in struggle in terms of a, di a different content. Why don't you guys take that up? I have there's there's questions coming in from online, but we'll do around here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which is perhaps what, what we are also facing more globally is, and not only in Iraq, I mean, I, when I say the green, the green zone regime doesn't stand on its own, what I mean is that it's part of a, a bigger uh, system that I call the military old capitalist complex that we can call, uh, you know, differently too. Um, maybe, maybe what we struggle is, I mean, as scholars is actually what people also are struggling with uh, uh, in the squares of protest, which is in some ways, I mean, Iraqis were not only facing the people in the green zone. And if, if they were only facing the people in the green zone, maybe there would, they, I mean, there would have been po possibilities for the green zone regime to fall, but actually it's not only about the green zone regime, right? And, and thinking also for me, um, and um, I have to say it's, it's not, um, it's not something very natural or very, I'm not necessarily used to think in, in this new frame uh, of the Anthropocene, uh, which is a new and different ways of, think, of thinking. It's a different ways of thinking because it's not only thinking uh, in relation to capitalism, but it's also thinking beyond capitalism. And this invitation also to kind of provincialize the human and look at life in, 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 in general. I mean, I, I found it very productive uh, and Productive because I think it also perhaps, um, I mean, it shows how much we are in a situation where the change that we need, not only in Iraq, but all over the world, is so radical to just preserve the future of life, of human life and life in general, right? So maybe this is also why, I mean, I think there is a conversation that needs to happen at the intersection between postcolonial studies. And, and the studies of empire and racial capitalism, uh, um, heterosexist, gendered, you know, capitalism, and this this new literature, this new very deep and and very interesting reflection on the Anthropocene, and this is perhaps also why I mean it it, it totally made sense. It's not something that I had to ex extrapolate. It's just and the Torah Tashrim is about hayat and life in general, and and the fact that it is actually happening in a region of the world that is you know, <laughs> Mesopotamia and the Fertile Crescent. And the fact that actually most of these protesters come from their parents, I mean, my parents actually come also from this region and had to integrate within, uh, uh, there was a, a brutal integration of this population within kind of uh, uh, urban modern lifestyle of, of, of Baghdad in the capital, right? I mean, this I think is 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 really interesting, and 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 I would love to have more conversation about about that, um, uh, about actually technologies. Uh, I think this is definitely a, a very very important question, and the ways in which I mean technologies are used by protesters, but the more they use them, and the more they are used against them. And actually, I mean, just to also answer very concretely, uh, many, many protesters, Iraqi protesters, cannot use social media anymore because uh, it's what we call the, the, the kind of electronic armies of, of the political establishment that attack them. Also, all the list of protesters that are made are actually based on, on social media posts, et cetera. So 
So there is really definitely something that is very, uh, I mean, frightening and very, uh, very, very scary uh, in the use, I mean, uh, by very, very repressive regime of these technologies to surveil and control people. But this is also why it was so important for people to actually physically meet in the squares of protest. And, and I mean, uh, when, you, when you post something online, you make yourself public about what you think. Uh, and actually, what was very interesting in, in Tahrir Square and also other squares uh, um, in the south of Iraq was there was a kind of a, a public square. There was a square that you know everybody could see, but there were also tents that were not accessible to 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 everyone. That not not everybody could could enter. There were actually tents where uh, mixed tents where uh, uh, young men and young women were, were, were living in, where conversations happened that would not happen on social media publicly and would also not happen in the more public kind of, 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 of part of the square. And this is only possible when people meet face to face, right? When, when they are actually together physically uh, in the same space. So uh, it doesn't answer all the questions, but it's just a, a few ideas. Coming back to something I started talking about before, based on the question about the reclamation of, of life and the slogans of life, liberty, and dignity, for example. And the, the, the question here becomes, I think, in some ways more restricted and in some ways more depressing in the sense that the claims are for a bare minimum of survival capabilities. We are not talking about reaching for a certain kind of, the, the word utopia has not been said today yet. So we are not talking, we've talked about horizons of possibility, we've talked about openings for reimagination, but we are no longer in the realm of grand narratives, and that, you know, that is very clear. But it seems as though we're actually in the realm of extremely restricted purview, so survival is at stake. We want to live but life is an extremely capacious and almost meaningless category unless we are simply going to talk about the right to water, food, shelter, housing, which is obviously a big part of this. But in terms of the theory practice dynamic, which I think Fadi will have more intelligent things to say about than, than I do, I, I think that that's at stake here. I think the impoverishment of theory of revolution might have to do with the impoverishment of a revolutionary agenda and the kind of ad hoc nature of revolutionary upsurge, especially in places of such extreme oppression as Syria. So, and, and, and Iraq and elsewhere, of course. Um, so I think we're still stuck with this question. I wanna to return to Zahra's provocation about the subject, about subjectivity. What is the revolutionary subject? Is it entirely determined on a national scale? Is it determined locally? Is it about the reclamation of the space of the local cafe or the main urban square or the national imaginary? What is, in, what, what, what is, what does the revolutionary subject of the Arab uprisings want? The question of content. I think you're right, uh, Nasser, in pointing out that the, there is a risk of uh, falling into a kind of nominalism, which is whenever someone says it's a revolution, it's a revolution. Uh, I'm close to that position. And I think that basically the wager mostly is a wager of political solidarity rather than a wager of uh, let's sit here in what looks like a 1950s Beirut literary salon and sort of like, you know, come up, come up with a definition. And I say that seriously because it's, uh, I, it's troubling to sort of sometimes, you know, adopt a nominalist position because basically then, you know, someone can say anything goes. But... But the, the difference between our present and the past is that the meaning of revolution, I think, in the past was given, which is what I tried to allude to. So it wasn't about process. So when, when Fatah, the Palestinian political party, 
calls itself you know Harakat Tahir Palestini Tawra Hatta Nasr. It's not about outcome. It's a national liberation movement that's calling itself a revolution. So it's a revolution because nation and class were the sort of two main wings through which the content of the revolution was given. You do, you know, you liberate yourself from the colonizer and then you reach a horizon of social justice internally. But if we are starting from the premise that the political is wider, power is wider, the social is wider, then, then I think we have to sort of fall back on a position that Zaha adopted and that I adopt as well, which is in a way the content is articulated and subsumed from the practices themselves and how, and how they're doing it. And it's a wager because there's, there are no guarantees. And there are no guarantees precisely because we are not no longer in that, in that, in that, in that, in that time. So, you know, when, uh, when the Lebanese mothers who are married to non-Lebanese uh, uh, citizens mobilize as part of the October Revolution to sort of, and they've been mobilizing before that in order to uh, basically mobilize to grant their children Lebanese passports because uh, the sort of the sort of sectarian patriarchy in Lebanon does not grant children of non-Lebanese fathers uh, passports. They are in doing that and in, in centering that demand. There is something which is which dislocates how the political is articulated, understood between, uh, let's say, you know, the languages of the Shia duo Amal Hasbollah versus you know the sort of Christian duo Lebanese forces. So there's a way in which the mobilizations on the street, the sort of articulation of a, of a very different sort of uh, political discourses. Now you, you may say this is not revolutionary. And I say what makes it revolutionary is, is the labor of uh, articulation. How, for example, this struggle is articulated with the social question, uh, articulated with uh, different kinds of struggle. So it's the articulation of these different sectorial, basically, the, these different sectorial mobilizations that show that there is, there may be dispersal and different kinds of struggles, but there is something called a regime. Because what the regime wants is to basically show that there's a division between uh, particular political positions on Israel versus the West or particular, particular position, you know, different sort of position on the question of the rights of particular sects, et cetera. So what you are doing is that you are really sort of undermining that whole, the articulation of that way in which that political game is played and talked about. So it's not only about sort of like injecting a new different, a new political language and, and re-articulating it, but rather by actually in doing so and in doing this particular articulation, you are, you are sort of showing that there is something here in which the people, however you wanna define them, and the residents as well, who are not citizens, are in a way sort of um, opposed to this sort of common common element that may be divided amongst itself between its different wings, but it's united against them. So, so the, the the short answer is, it's very difficult at this time, at this day and age, to actually say, you know, what is what is the con is there a sort of a content that uh, that travels and that is uh, one content for all, like a big concept, like nation and class, like it used to be, I think. And then that, uh, you know, it will sort of, um, it will catch like sort of wildfire everywhere. So I think that would be, that would be my answer, that, the, that, that difficulty that we're, we're facing, I think, has to do with the sort of nature of, of, of struggles. Uh, today, which is what I tried to say when in, in my paper about why revolution haunts the uprising series and why the uprising series is called the uprising series, precisely because of that point. It's sort of, uh, it's easier to work on that front. The question about the invisibility of uh, materiality is, I mean, I don't, <laughs> I think about it. I don't, I'm not sure if I have you know, something to say in terms of, how to counter it, but there is, 
there's there's something you know fascinating about the sort of extent of of surveillance and that's not only you know i mean that and that that's that could be about sort of you know spying on our phones but also you know if you sort of walk around uh, beirut and you realize the amount of security cameras that have been there it's just it's just amazing to see how how so to speak there's different ways in which you know our sort of our digital traces our uh, our our movements our bodily movements in space are are recorded and and what kind of you know sort of possibilities they can sort of you know could be made could be made out of out of all these sort of like this uh, the registering of all these different uh, traces yeah go ahead right 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 I, I do think so as well. I do think so as well. And uh, beyond the anxiety that it provokes in me, I don't know. If, <laughs> I don't know if I have anything intelligent to say about it because I do not. I you know I haven't sort of like thought through it. But I do. I do think that there is. There's definitely something. You know. There's definitely something uh, here to sort of like to to sort of think through in terms of in terms of uh, how it works but you know on the other hand as well when you think about how whatsapp groups are sort of like mobilized by sort of different militants on the ground you can think about how i don't know one can adopt a, a dialectical relationship to to how that which enable you to connect maybe you know maybe also you know, a big source of vulnerability for your own sort of like for, for the mediation of struggles so there's something that you said Fadi, that I, I don't want to pounce on it. I want to push on it. It has to do with your point about nominalism. Um, if what we're doing here in trying to understand the relationship between theory and practice and the conceptualization of revolution, then our theory must be predicated on a certain set of criteria of judgment. And if we employ the concept of nominalism as a way in, and we must take as seriously what I'm describing in terms of counter revolutionary practice. So at a certain point, what that does, that turn to nominalism does kind of explore the extremely political choices that come into determining which of the struggles, however articulated, are worthy of the name. So I, for some reason, and I don't want to open up the Ukraine Pandora's box, but the the Azov Battalion springs to mind as an example of, in some perspectives, a revolutionary movement to liberate the country. There are also those who would say this is a fascistic Nazi organization and there probably is um, a, maybe a less wide range of opinion about that question in this room than there is outside of it. But it does strike me that analogically speaking, there is the same problem there in terms of determining what the proper criteria evaluation of the revolutionarity of a given movement or institution is. So that I thought what you said, there, there's some space there to jockey for position. So um, let's hold that space. whole divide around the modern assumptions that used to basically undergird what is what is a left so you know yeah so we don't have to go it's been it's been going on for 50 years or like 40 years now since the islamic revival at least you know in, in the sense of these these undergirding assumptions of what is it to be a progressive have been shaken which is why part of you know sort of like the anti-globalization left for example, in Europe is a very nationalist and an anti-migrant. So like the, the, the sort of boundaries between left and right are completely sort of blurred on many different things, including the question of globalization and nation, the question of secularism, secularism and religion. So in a way, it's a very difficult question, but I mean, if we're asked to sort of like lay the ground for a new foundation, I think it's a very sort of tall order. And maybe, maybe the times do not, you know, maybe if you're thinking reflexively, maybe the sort of the times we live in are not times that are amenable, amenable to sort of like lay that new foundation, but rather to sort of like think together on on the ground of basically, you know, 
on the ground, so it's basically what constitutes sort of like emancipatory projects. I mean, you know, Anand Singh sort of has this nice sentence, which is, which is where, where she says, you know, the sort of, um, the challenge is when she's thinking about solidarity, she says the challenge is to think about how can we be together while different, so to speak. And that's, that's partly what we're trying to sort of think about, because if you think about the question of solidarity uh, in back in the 60s, I mean, you know, you were sitting in Beirut, you knew exactly who you, who you were sided with in Vietnam or in Colombia or Venezuela or, you know, or in Cairo or in Nigeria. So that, that, that ground that sort of on which people's ideological orientations and affinities were sort of like made was, was pretty clear, you know, but that's, not, that's no longer the case today. It's no longer the case, again, I think since the Islamic revival. I mean, for me, one nodal, uh, one nodal uh, sort of point is like the Rushdie affair in the 80s and the, and the fatwa that Khomeini issued against Rushdie in the 80s and how the left was sort of split about, you know, around that in the Arab world, but in the, in the, in the West as well. You know, you had all these books published in the Arab world by uh, Arab intellectuals who are in defense of freedom of speech, but then there was a question of sort of racism and Islamophobia coming out. So there's, that's the sort of nature of the world we inhabit in a way where where the sort of nominalist position, and yes, it is open, and you can you can see it in Ukraine, you can see it in uh, you know the sort of withdrawal of solidarity with the Syrian revolution, for example, on the basis of like anti-imperialism, so to speak, of the regime and things like that. So, so we have uh, a few questions that came in from the the Zoom from the our fine people uh, on the internet, um, and we have time for like one round, and then we're gonna break we have some snacks and drinks and then we'll reconvene around 3 30 for our second panel um so there are uh, a couple of questions from actually two different uh people that center on this question of counter-revolution so i'll try and sum them up uh as briefly as i can um one uh, is you know asking you all to reflect a little bit more on the nature and role of contemporary counter-revolution uh in comparison to the previous forms of counter-revolution, what's new about counter-revolution in the contemporary moment than what we've um, seen historically? And does that tell us anything about how successful these counter-revolutionary movements have been um, prior, you know, compare, in comparison to, to previous movements? Um, and the, the second is um, you know, asking you guys to, to comment a little bit on what seems to be like the, the common um, wager that these counter-revolutionary movements seem to put before people, which is, uh, you know, on the one hand, do you choose a corrupt and oppressive secular dictatorship, or on the other, Islamic radicalism and terrorism? I mean, this is this is the the uh, you know the way the question is phrased. The second question, which is a little meaty, but I'm going to try and um, you know summarize it here, uh, comes from Katie Montoya, uh, and and picks up on the evolution of the political, and as we've talked about with Zahra's comments, uh, it's sort of trajectory towards the personal. Um, uh, she references particularly uh, a documentary called The Little Palestine by Abdullah Abdel Khatib. I don't know if uh, you've seen it. Um, she says, you know, these sorts of films and uh, other uh, forms of cultural and intellectual production provide a concrete rebuttal of the idea that mass-oriented politics of the material and everyday cannot be theorized or vigorously studied and understood. Um, she'd love to hear more about how you all uh, see this shift, the personal and uh, the output of film, poetry, cultural production, perhaps uh, in some of the uh, material in Max's new book uh, and its impact on the revolutionary potential and how we study and archive outbreaks of revolutionary activity in the Arab world. Well, um, on counter-revolution, I think actually the Iraqi context is <laughs> is perhaps is is a little uh, different than in, in, than other contexts in the sense that what happened after two thousand and three is that actually the political establishment that came with the U.S.-led occupying forces, uh, the U.S. Uh, um, administration. Uh, <laughs> quickly actually uh, um, shifted the discourse uh, in kind of um, an alliance with, with Iran. And, um, and it's interesting to see that actually, for example, the, the accusations 
uh, that has been made to protesters is that they are Zionists, is, the, is that they are uh, funded by the Americans. Of course, the, all, the language of the repression is also very sexual and very gendered, like they have been accused of being cross-dressers, homosexuals, et cetera, et cetera. But I think that what actually struck a lot of people, especially in the US or, or outside of Iraq, is that um, if we look at um, the gener what, what come out of the protests is that protesters really emphasize on, on critiquing uh, Iran, actually, and really emphasize on critiquing the Iran-backed militias. And, and of course, there, are, I mean, there, there is also a discourse against any forms of influence, but this is really what came, came out of the protest. And this is simply the result of the fact that the political establishment has done so much in kind of performing its anti-Americanism that actually if you, if you, if you say that you are, an, an, if you use an anti-imperialist discourse in post-2003 Iraq, you are associated with the Iraqi political establishment. So, it, I mean, it really shows how, how things are also evolving in terms of, 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 of the use of these terms, uh, which does not mean that, you know, people uh, 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 don't uh, criticize as much uh, uh, Iran and, and the U.S., but in this context, uh, the, you know, what I would call the counter-revolutionary forces have, I mean, systematically accused the protesters of being uh, f financed by the American embassy, etc. And so this really has, has kind of shaped the way protesters have, have then uh, counter-reacted and really emphasized on, on critiquing Iran and the Iran-backed militias. Um, so I think, I, I, I mean, I think it's, it's good to keep this in mind and how actually language, I mean, change uh, on this. Um, the, uh, I, I'm trying to remember the end of the question. Um, that was asked can can you just repeat no the second one yeah the, the end of it was um she'd love to hear more about how you all see uh, the shift from the to the towards the personal uh as political uh, uh in in film poetry oh, and little palestine yeah. no no this is yeah 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 no actually i i mean i, I watch actually little palestine there was a um a screening at the Institute for Advanced Studies, and, and I mean, I found it very challenging to watch, but also very, I mean, powerful in the sense that it's it's an incredible film in the sense is that it's it's very ethnographic. It's also very, I mean, uh, poetic. I mean, the, the the shift also with the the dialect, the Palestinian Syrian dialect, and, and the comments of, of the filmmaker that are in 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 uh, uh, classical Arabic, and and. It's not every day that we have a film that actually documents someone who has been experiencing a siege and that is filming what is going on, uh, I mean, inside. And I think, but, but in some ways, I mean, it was very interesting to see also after watching the film, the kind of silences. And, and I, I mean, I would be curious actually in other uh, places where the film is screened is when you, when you see these images in connection with actually the lack of this grand narrative that used to uh, uh, that used to exist, the anti-imperialist left, the the also I mean uh, uh, um, I mean all, all of these very political kind of ready-made narratives. Very often, as as an audience, we what happened after the screening of the film is was it was like most people were actually silent and and didn't know what to do uh, uh, after watching images that were. I mean, extremely, extremely shocking. So I think that this really connects with how how do we, as scholars uh, um, and also as I mean, activists, how do we make sense of really the shift of of the narratives of the the absence of these big uh, narratives and how how do we I mean uh, try to uh, come up with 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 something to answer. The images. I mean, I'm sorry for those who haven't seen the film, but I, I, if you if you if you if you've seen the film, you you'll understand what I mean. Uh, yeah, it's. I mean, it's it's really a challenge. It seems to me that there are two sides uh, to the question that's in play right now. One is a historical question, and the other is a contemporary question in terms of thinking about counter-revolution strikes me that 
if we think about an earlier period, let's call it the Cold War, then we're talking about a very different conception of counter-revolution, one that has something to do with counter-insurgency, one that has something to do with anti-communism, one that has something to do with at once attempting to stifle the aspirations of post-colonial revolutionary regimes while also looking to smash um, in no uncertain terms, revolution, revolutionary movements that offer either one form of support from below of those regimes or else their own kind of internationalist or other kind of radical political project. And so um, one aspect of the, the problem of counter-revolutionarity, it seems to me, is in managing the distinction among all of those scales, the local, the national, the regional, and the international, and the context obviously matters. Um, counter-revolutionary form of knowledge is as situated a form of knowledge as any other. And to the extent that one can um, identify a certain amount of ideology at play in the, in, the, in the practice of whatever is deemed counter-revolutionary, I think we're brought back to something that Fadi had introduced a moment ago about the problem of the religious and the secular. And so if we are talking about uh, ostracizing, or we're talking about a matter of tahween when it comes to, say, those who represent the Iranian project, which is often code for a religious project, or those in the uh, secular revolutionary project, soi-disant, in the Syrian case, for example, those who would seek to either reject or absorb the religious participate in the same distinction of a secular as opposed to a religious project, then those attempt to square the circle with the civil state movement or whatever kind of moderate third way wasatiya we're trying to get involved with but whatever the case the accusation of counter-revolutionarity is as significant and substantive here both in terms of uh, labeling the other and participating in their extradition from whatever fold we're talking about but also in terms of the definition of the rightly revolutionary and so the way that this evolves over time i I think it's such a large question I couldn't possibly begin to look at. And in terms of the reflection, in terms of cultural production in a place like Syria, there, there is a shift towards the same kind of thematic concerns that we were talking about before with respect to dignity, life, death, some of these fundamental moral considerations. And they're reflected in interesting ways. And I mean, some of the the themes that crop up in, in my analysis of Syrian literature and film of the post-revolutionary, that is post-2011 period, is their attention to matters of personal testimony, witnessing matters of one's own struggle for bare life and an encounter with myriad forms and faces of death and dying and suffering. And while there are forms of suffering at play in the kind of political commitment culture that came in the generation and generations before, it's of a different nature altogether. And it is about commitments to the kind of affective considerations and the sort of day-to-day -day concerns of people simply trying to scratch out a decent life. So in that respect, I do think that without reducing literature or film to social text, there is a great amount of reflection that one can find there. Let me uh, just say a few things uh, that start where Max ended, which I think is a, you know, we've been talking about a lot about sort of theory and practice, understandably, since we're thinking about revolution, but, but I think the question of, if we divorce the question of critique from theory, then uh, we realize that uh, in the Arab world and elsewhere, if you're thinking within a Gramscian uh, lens of, how are you know how are some counter hegemonic sort of perspective produced the question of the arts i think is essential uh you know and and if we if we go back to the 70s and the 80s uh, and think about someone like um, the lebanese uh, communist uh, playwright musician uh, ziad al-habani who, who now unfortunately ended up in very sort of like counter-revolutionary sort of positions. But if we go, if you think about, if you think about the past, and if we think about the, the kind of, if we go back to the problematic of revolution and consciousness, if you think about the kind of works that he produced in terms of uh, the sort of critique of sectarianism, uh, 
um, sort of pointing out class and everyday life and more importantly uh, producing an alternative language of identification for people which sort of goes beyond uh, sectarian identities you realize that there is here a proper sort of like um, a proper intellectual project at work that interpolated many different generations of people in the way that maybe uh, someone uh, like Mehdi Amil, the sort of Algerian uh, communist philosopher of the Lebanese Communist Party, did not have that that kind of reach. So I think it's interesting to also think about the question of practice in relationships to and critique in relationship to practice outside of the domain of theory. Of course, the the attractiveness of theory is its powers of conceptual assumption that allows it to travel easily. But you know, a, a, you know, a, a, an ethnographic text. Uh, a sort of play could travel, but I think, you know, when you're talking about sort of big concepts, you know, like nation and class, they're, they're much more sort of smooth flyers than sort of like, uh, than, than sort of, um, than other sort of intellectual products, to put it this way. But I think the question of aesthetics and politics is very interesting to sort of think, and that's what sort of, I think Zahra and Max were saying, and maybe one, for me, at least one piece of evidence that what we've witnessed since 2010 are revolutions and not merely uprising is that I think there's a, um, a sort of deep transformation in structures of feeling, which are which are now being sort of, in a way, um, represented by a very different kind of um, of Arab intellectual productions, whether in film or in or in novels. Or in a different kind of writing, I think that that one and you, you know that Katie's question about the sort of the sort of the question of the political and the personal is one perspective, but there is something I think there is something seismic, like and uh, there is like a something seismic that's happening. You can see it in Arab hip hop, for example. That's one avenue in which you can sort of like uh, you, you you can sort of detect that. So. Um, yeah, I I mean the question of counter revolution. To go back to the secular religious sort of, you know, sort of split, I think there's something interesting in, in the sort of uh, strategies of sort of counter revolution, which they don't have this question to sort of like, you know, sort of deal with. As I tried to say, you know, the, the practice of tahween of accusing someone of treason is a practice that has been used by people of different ideological shades. Uh, I mean, in Lebanon in 219, that was sort of. There's another technique as well that's that's not ideological, which is um, excluding people from sort of the political spectrum through, I know it sounds very 1960s, but through basically dubbing them as deviants. So one of the things, for example, that was sort of, uh, one of the rumors that the, you know, sort of media that's uh, close to people in, in power in Lebanon was circulating is that, you know, these people are sort of drug addicts. So what you get is, you get the question of sort of social shaming, which is through a sort of a very old sociological lens of who are the deviants. So you've got basically, you know, sex and drugs and spies. And therefore these cannot be proper revolutionaries because they're doing sex drugs and basically getting money from American NGOs. and American. So this is discursively, this is one technique, but of course there's bodily intimidation as well, which we've seen in Lebanon through, uh, through a very, very sort of typical counter revolution technique, which is not allowing people to sort of occupy space by burning their tents, stealing their laptops, kicking them out, beating them. So, uh, I, and, and we've seen that as well in, uh, in, in Syria when the revolution started. So law and order, of course, is always there, rounding people up, putting them in jail, soft, soft, uh, so, sort of kind of like underlying soft repression. But also, as I mentioned in Iran, a lot of gas uh, uh, shooting people with rubber bullets sometimes in their eyes. People lost their eyes. So there is, and and activists in France have also sort of you know pointed out to sort of p shooting people in the eyes with rubber bullets. And I'm saying that because I think these counter-revolutionary sort of you know uh, strategies, again, like theory, they fly, and and the people get sort of like. They learn from each other. So these are a few sort of, uh, you know, a few things that people, you know, shooting people with rubber bullets to maim them, uh, shooting 
ex extraordinary amounts of gas uh, at people to choke them, uh, beating them up with, with sticks, rounding them up, or sometimes um, shaving their hair, for example, you know, so to sort of to, to stigmatize them through a, a form of bodily marking in which power marks the body through a particular sort of like indelible mark. You, you round someone up, you beat them up, you shave their hair, you send them off again. So uh, plus the discourses of treason are, these are multiple sort of strategies. Uh, is it time for our break? It is. Thank, thank you guys very much. Let's get a round of applause for everyone.